Hey everyone, what's up? Welcome to episode seven of the Everyday Bow Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Mike Manley. This week, my brother Dan and I dig into a listener question about arrows and arrow weight. Then we dive into all the gear that nobody really talks about that you can't forget to take with you this season when you're hunting. We really dig into a bunch of stuff that really nobody talks about. So hang on for that. And then we also go into the last minute scouting we're doing when to avoid going back in the woods, and how to find and hunt that hot sign that you need to be successful this year. So let's get ready to dive into it, and let's go. Welcome to the Everyday Bow Hunter. I'm your host, Mike Manley, retired Green Beret turned bow hunter, joined by my brother, Dan Zima. We're here to share tips, stories, and talk gear, all from our unique points of view. Whether you're just starting out, your seasoned bow hunter, I think you're going to like it. So let's go. All right. Welcome to episode seven. Ready to kick it in, Dan? Hey, we're back. Let's All go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, I'm going to start this pod off a little off the kilter. This is just a, uh, it's one of those stories that you put in that box, which is hard to believe, but it actually happened to me on Labor Day. And so we had built this kayak, yeah, we had built this kayak trailer, to my wife and I. I and remember seeing you build it, yeah. <laughs> 100, 130 some bolts and pieces. That was just a, a nightmare. But anyway, so we took the kayaks down to Susquehanna and we're getting ready to, to put in, right? And as we're putting in, there's uh, the guy with uh, with his family, his wife, and and like a 12 year old kid, and they're putting in as well in the smallest John boat you've ever seen. Now, this boat is loaded to the gills with stuff, coolers, fishing gear, uh, you name it. And then he put the family in there, and and he and he, I'm saying, hey, that boat's a little full. It's gonna it's gonna ride pretty low in the water. And he's like, well, I'm giving it a shot. This is my first boat ever and my first time putting it in the water. And I'm like, okay. You know, and I'm like, I go up and I actually, I put, you know, my, help my wife push off on her kayak. She's out in the water. And then I go over to them and he's like, hey, can you, can you help push us, you know, into the water? I'm like, sure. So I go and I, I lift it up and push him out and everything. So I'm getting into my kayak and I get myself in the water and I'm going out to meet my wife. And all of a sudden this guy starts yelling, help, help. I need help. My trolling motor doesn't work. <laughs> and, and his wife and the kid have these oars that are like, I don't know, like these, the three foot oars thing type things. And they're oh, like putting them in the water and nothing's happening. And they're going down, downstream, <laughs> right? They're going downstream. So I'm, I'm in a kayak. You know, my wife's in a kayak. Well, anyway, Tanya, my wife, gets closer and they throw her a rope. And I said, well, there's no way she's doing anything. So I, I motor over, I get around, I put the rope around my waist and I just start hammering it with the kayak. <laughs> and, and I pulled them about, I don't know, maybe 50 yards, you know, 50 yards in a kayak, pulling a boat, heavy boat like that. I was smoked. So luckily, there was another guy putting in, and he didn't wait for his family. He just saw it was happening. He put in, came around with his boat. I threw him the rope, and he towed him the rest of the way to the boat ramp. But I was like, oh, my God. Amateur hour on the river. Man. He, I was like, he didn't make sure that his trolling motor was charged. The battery. Was the battery, really yeah. I, I, and I mean, it's one of the, you know, it's just doing your. Here you are on a major holiday. Never, I, that ain't the time. I, I mean, I guess it is because you had people there to help, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the only, that's his only saving grace because he went into panic mode. He was, he was screaming, how deep's the water here? Can I get in? But you know, like this, yeah. if he could get out and just pull the boat back in. But Well, how deep was it? I mean, if you just uh, um, probably like five, six feet. I don't know. Tanya put her oar down and couldn't touch the bottom. So he oh. was like, I ain't getting in that. <laughs> did you put it, did you put in on the York side? Yes. Down at Wrightsville, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Columbia side, it's shallow for a good 50, 60 yards out, you know, until it drops off a little bit. 
yeah, well, anyway, we went and then finally you know, could re relax. But I started off my kayak and already tired. I was whooped. <laughs> Trying to <laughs> pull a boat with a kayak is not exactly the best case scenario. And I mean, this literally sounds like something that would happen to me and dad. Like, <laughs> yeah, you, uh, can't yeah, yeah. you can't make <laughs> it up. <laughs> can't fix stupid. <laughs> yeah. So oh, anyway, we'll get into the, get into the podcast here. Now, what we want to do is we'll start off with, you know, listener questions just to kind of kick the pot off each week, kind of, kind of a new thing we want to do. And <laughs> one of the questions I got was through, through the blog. And it asked, Hey, you know, in your last episode, you talked a lot about arrows and why they're important and how you, that was one of your biggest lessons learned, but you really didn't go into details. Now we've kind of hit this subject a couple of times across a couple, a couple pods. And I thought right. I'd just quickly, quickly answer this. And then you can add your two cents to it too, Dan. Roger that. So first off, why arrow weight matters? Well, first, if you take a pencil, a number two pencil, super sharp, at five yards, you throw it as hard as you can at the wall. What's going to happen? It might stick or it might bounce off, right? Yeah. But you take a hammer, ball peen hammer at that same five yards and you throw it as hard as you can, it's going, it's going through the drywall, Yeah. right? It's penetrating. And that whole reason is mass. So it has that mass, right? But also if you back up 10 yards with that hammer, you, you might, might just get enough to, to dent it and not get through the wall. You're right? going to so lose kinetic energy. Yeah. You're going to lose kinetic energy. So the whole thing is that there's a upper spectrum and a lower spectrum. For example, if you shoot a 300 grain arrow, there's a chance that you might get minimal per penetration. But if you sh shoot a 600 grain arrow, um, it might blow through the deer, right? Because of that mass. But there's a middle ground. Every single person has their optimal weight arrow. And of course we could throw in FOC and, and, you know, the front end weight of your arrow, it went that above 13%, but that's just, a, that's, you know, aside from the subject, the subject right. is the, the weight. So if you have to find that basic, you know, bell curve spot where your kinetic energy and momentum and speed are all perfectly aligned. So you're not dropping off the scale. And that's the best for you. So it might be 500, like me, I'm like, I came out to like 498 for me and it could be 550 for somebody else. And if you have like a 32 inch draw, it could be 650, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's all those things to take into consideration, but that's why arrow weight matters because the amount of force, the amount of mass and the, how fast it hits that deer yeah. optimally is going to, you know, take you from a glancing, you know, if you don't have a perfect broadside shot. Uh, where it bounces off or just sticks in it inside them a little bit and they're they're running away with the arrow flopping on them to where you know you have a, a 550 grain arrow with a great and the broadheads matter too of course and, and it blows through the deer blows through bone and everything else so yeah that's my that's my two cents on that question what do you got Dan? yeah i mean i i agree with everything you said and i mean draw light and draw weight have everything to do with that Absolutely. So you have to take into consideration if like me per se, I'm only drawing 60 pounds because I have this tour muscle. So I, I can't, I mean, I can pull back more, but it would like, if you're practicing shooting a lot, it's going to tear me up. So anyway, to make a long story short, I have to stay a little bit lighter on the edge. You know, I have it. I have to be a little bit lighter because of my draw length or weight mm -hmm. and I'm 27 and a half draw length. So, you know, mathematically, I, I mean, I want to pass through. I want to break bones. So I opted to go heavier. I'm not necessarily worried about speed. I really don't want to shoot outside of a, you know, 20 to 30 yard range. And I think mm -hmm. if, if, if I'm keeping that my, my window, I can stay heavier still have enough speed, but get that kinetic energy through a heavier arrow to accomplish what I want. And I, I don't want, I don't want deflection. So I've seen it happen. I had it, you know, you know, it was a lethal result, but I, you know, take out some of the, the problems that could happen. And, you know, that that's where I stand with, you know, arrow weight. It, you have to know all your math before you go in and get these arrows, you know, it's. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there's two things that you you can affect to, that increase your speed, kinetic energy, and momentum. There's only two things you can change. Mm -hmm. That's the bow you're shooting, right? And your and your draw weight because your yeah. draw length is set. You can't change your draw length, and that actually has the biggest effect on it overall because yeah. you're not pulling pulling the the string back far enough, or yeah, as far as somebody else with like a thirty inch or thirty two inch. I, I I do have a question, and sure. maybe you're the guy to answer this. So it's my right. okay, like my bow, I can set the the pounds let off. Okay, so my mine goes from seventy. 80 or 90 mm -hmm. and they say at 90 yeah it's really easy to hold back for a long period of time but you lose a lot yeah. right so yeah. technically i with if i'm right about this with me being only 60 pounds draw i want to be at 70 pound let all to make it snappier to get more out of it am i right about that if you do is yeah. that logic of thinking that would do it yeah that would okay. that would yeah. give you a little more now each bow specifically when they give you that that FPS for the max for the bow. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have a Matthews and it said it's rated at three, 325 feet per second. Right. That's with like a, a five grain per inch arrow yeah, yeah. and a 30 inch draw length yeah. and whatever, whatever let off had lost it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever let off that they set it to. And that could be at 80, right? They could have 80% as their set that they did for that. And right. that's, that's what that speed is. So, but when you adjust that let off, that speed now, can go up or down based on that. Right. Nate at Stream Archery said to me, he said, Hey, to get the most out of that bow, it's, it's 60 pound max. I'll max it out, but you're going to want to do 70 pound let off. You're going to get more out of it. You can go 80 if, cause your shoulder later, if you find that 70 is too much, but he goes, I, I would like to see you start at, you know, and there you go again, having a great technician dialing you in is everything because sometimes you're not thinking about the little things just going to that bow shop and having that tech you know a professional dial you in it's everything yeah absolutely so that's a great question i hope we answered it we really went into some detail there i hope that answers all your questions if you have more questions obviously you can you know on youtube put your questions in the comments let us know you know we'll go over it the next pod or you know on archeryhunting.com, go in there to the contact us page and we'll, you know, be sure to get you, you know, that question answered on the, on the next pod if we can. So we'd love to hear from you and uh, more questions are better. We're yeah. going to feature, feature one, at least one or two each week. You know, and, and, and asking us questions, we might not have the answer, but we could find it for you. And me and Mike are going to learn too in the process sometimes. Absolutely. I, I think it's, we it's definitely good for don't everybody. know everything. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no doubt. That's why it's the everyday bow hunter. So, anyway, with this this episode, what we're diving into is we're going to talk about gear prep and the key pieces of gear that we use that no one really talks about, but are kind of essential for bow hunters. Everybody talks about the bow and the tree stand and all that other stuff, yeah. but there's a lot of other nitty gritty stuff that we really don't talk about that can be can really help somebody out, especially when you're starting out and you need to know. Hey, you know, man, I re really needed this in the woods. Well, we always carry this or I always carry it or Dan carries something else. So we're going to talk about that. Yeah. But, uh, the first thing we we'll talk about Dan is, uh, what, what hunting clothes are you using for the early season and how, how does that change for you as it gets colder and, and what, what camera are you using, uh, and why? Okay. So me personally, early season, I'm going like, like traverse or Scentlock has great, I think it's the Savannah gear. That's great early season. It's real light. I personally, that's, you know, my window that leads me into mid season and mid season, you kind of start ramping up on thicker base layer, stuff like that. And I mean, our mid season still kind of mild, so you could keep your early season top on, just go heavier with the base layer. I like to do that. And, and of course, you know, the, when you get closer to rut, that's where I'm getting into the bibs and, and stuff like that. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, now my early season thought process camo pattern is I like that sub Alpine because everything's so green and lush. I think the sub Alpine kind of really blends with me hunting off the ground that really blends great. Uh, you know, 
you head into midseason when the leaves start changing colors, that's where I kind of go mossy oak. That way I'm kind of more blending in with those colors. Mossy oak brings that out. And then, you know, later, in, later when the leaves start coming off, you have more of that open background, so to speak. It's more, I call it barren wasteland, you know, when it leaves her off. And that's where I kind of do the elevated too. Mm -hmm. That most of my, you know, farther into rut season is all sick of gear pretty much. And that's, I have the elevated too. That's, that's, that's my setup. Okay. So for me, you know, if, with it being hot, if obviously you want a wicking layer, cause you're going to sweat, you yeah, need that yeah. wicking layer, that light layer. And the one thing we talked about earlier is the bugs. Yeah. Uh, this year, especially, I mean, I've been in the woods scouting and the bugs have been horrendous. So it's always good to prep with this. Yeah. Permethrin. Yeah. Treat your, treat your hunting clothes with permethrin. It's yeah. supposed to be odor free when it dries. Uh, I don't know what the deer could smell on that, but. And they it's say more, it goes it's a couple, fine. couple wash cycles too. It lasts. Yeah. 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 I think if you do the spray on, it might last like six or seven wash cycles. So it can last yeah. you through the whole hunting season. Yeah. Uh, not that you usually need it that long, right. but, uh, that's why I got, and I'm testing out, uh, this year I got the Sitka Equinox guard pants and hoodie, and they have the insect shield stuff built into it. Right. And, uh, the insect shield stuff, it's not just Sitka specific insect shield is an actual company. They sell their own products, et cetera. Okay. But, um, what they do is they embed permethrin into the clothes themselves or into the material themselves. And before it even made into a pants or whatever, and it's supposed to last, uh, either lifetime of the, of the garment or 70, 70 washes, which I don't know how you measure that, but it's a lot of washes. So anyway, the pants, the pants are really good. They got side zips on them and stuff for venting out, you know, yeah. uh, they, they're a little bit heavier because I think it's going to help carry me into the mid season more. Like you're talking yeah. about, I yeah. can throw a base layer under there and still, still vent out when I'm walking in, you know, when, it, when you're you know, doing a good hike and stuff. And that, that bottom layer then can also be used as a wicking layer. And then I have that Sika ambient hoodie throw in the pack. I can pull that out when it gets chillier and stuff, but I'm also testing, um, four Lowe's insect shield set up too. I'm testing that. And I have a whole slew of clothes that I don't want to get into right now that I'm testing through the season. That would be a whole episode. So, um, but that's, that's kind of where I stand and like you. My, my camo thing is I truly, you know, I try to stick with whatever the background looks like and you're, you're dead on that, yeah. that sick, uh, up the fade subalpine is meant for that ground hunting scenario yeah. that you're talking about. It's, that's what it's built for. They did massive testing on deer, deer vision with that. And they have, what's it called? Well, it's called a disruption style camouflage. So it's yeah, supposed yeah. to confuse confuse a deer with micro and macro dispersion. And I think that's a great camo setup. I'm using that. I'm using elevated two. Yeah. I'm using Osio gears stuff, which has their Raptor camouflage. It's like an owl and stuff. So there's a couple yeah. different things I'm testing and who the heck knows what works the best until, yeah. you know, there's so many scenarios that you can get busted on. It's hard to tell what camo is great and what's like not. for me. So Mossy Oak does make, what the heck is the name of it? It's a line in Mossy Oak that looks like tree bark, ground cover, whatever it's called. Bottomland? Bottom Bottomland. Thank you. Bottom land. And I should probably invest more into that now that I'm ground hunting, because if I'm up against trees more in certain setups, if I know that that setup, I'm going to be using that, that, you know, summit tree seat, that stump seat and my to break up my silhouette is going to be that tree. I should be wearing something more bark. Like, you know what I mean? I think but, the old man's using something like that. Yeah. I got some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's good stuff. I mean. Yeah. So, uh, so when it comes to the gear that you need that, you know, people we talk, you know, talk about, but you, the gear you need that people don't talk about the small stuff that really matters. What are you carrying into the woods? Uh, what's in your pack? And, uh, and what stuff are you carrying to help you recover the deer post post shot? I mean, I, you know, there's your necessities for me. It's a good pair of glasses, binoculars. The rangefinder is the elite of the essential, you know, for me, that's, 
without a doubt, always in the pack, can't not have it. And then from that point, you know, wherever that's going to fall, <laughs> thermals, wind direction, you know. Milkweed. He was, he was dropping, Dave was dropping milkweed and now he's, now he's using his. It's a good locator of deer. Can. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's simple things, you know, of course, your, your knife, because if you're successful, you will need it you know, a good sharp knife, but, you know, speaking on that success, good drag rope. Sorry, Mike. I know the father-in-law did not make you one, just me and dad, but he ended up retiring <laughs> before he could make one, but you know, a good drag rope is pretty important. You know, if you're going to be successful, I, I, I'll stand it bloody now. I mean, for me, there is, I just lost the name of it. This looks stuff. It looks like underarm deodorant. Oh, you're talking about the, uh, oh my God, I can't. Evercom. Evercom, yeah. You know, Evercom, with me being on the ground, I, I feel like, you know, the guy in the tree, it's not as essential for me to kind of mask my, you know, residual scent that I'm letting out with a little bit of herd smell, bedding smell, you know, it is pretty important. So that's something that I'm always carrying too, you know, that that's kind of my essentials right there that I, that I have in my bag. Well, sure. grunt too for later, you know, grunt, you know, that's, that's pretty damn important too. So yeah, I was, I was taking out all my stuff and, and laying it out and, and then open up. I have, I have a bin that I have all my stuff in for the whole archery season that I take to camp with me and stuff. And I was pulling all this stuff out then. And I was like, oh my God, I am so behind on getting my gear ready. And I thought I was ahead yeah. and I was like, wow, I need to put this here and that there. And, and I pulled out, you know, I have my hunting license in my, in my pack now. It's already there. I got my, my knife with a gut hook on it. I have my multi-tool, Leatherman multi-tool that's in, in there. So I can, you know, fix stuff and have the pliers and stuff if I need it. I have my Allen wrenches. So if I need to do any bow maintenance in the woods, which I've had to do in the yeah. past. And if you have a broadhead issue, that, that Leatherman helps as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, the milkweed, as you already said, have yeah. that stocked up and ready to go. And... It's also about, like I said, the last episode, I make sure like in my, in my saddle, I have the pouches on the sides. I make drop sure bags that, or what are you, are you yeah. dump bags? Yeah. Yeah. The magazine dump, the dump pouches that are used for, for putting your mags in after you shoot a bunch of guys in the overseas. But <laughs> so, what the, <laughs> was that wrong? But anyway, let's make it. It is what it is. That was your career. I mean, <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I put stuff in there. Like I'll have the milkweed down at the bottom of that. But on top of that, I'll have, you know, my, my lineman's rope come out first. And then I'll have my, in there, I have my tree strap that has all my hooks on for all the things I'm going to hook around the tree. Like you said, your binoculars, your grunt tube, yeah. you know, your bow hanger, so you can hang your bow on the tree since I'm up in the tree. Yeah. I'll have all those things. I have a bunch of camera stuff, the camera arm that I'm taking yeah. uh, with the camera set up, GoPro set up yeah. and, and all the stuff that comes with, with the cameras. So that's a, that's a lot of gear. And yeah. this season, I guess not every hunt, but this season I'm going to be testing Ozonics as well. We got the HR yeah. 500 unit and that thing's got some weight to it. So I ain't going to be carrying that all the time, but yeah, <laughs> like I said, I, I have no expectation. And I know, that, it's that so thing, hard. That know. thing does make a sound. <laughs> the fan, it's a, you can hear that fan. So, oh I'm really? Wondering. Oh yeah. You can hear the fan. Okay. So I'm wondering how that's. That's going to be, you know, well, that's now happening. how high above you do you have to put it? Does it say, um, they say six to 12 inches above and uh, that's it. And you, yeah. And you point it like a 30 degree angle. Okay. Cause it want they want the ozone to come down in front of you. Right. Yeah. So as your scent goes forward, that comes in downwind, but you want that to cover your downwind side. So yeah. if a deer, you know, wind checks you or, or something like that, I don't know. We'll see. I'll test it. You know what? I'll test. I'll try anything once. So real quick, this might sound a little petty, but there's two things that are a necessity if you're successful and a zip tie, you got to be able to sign that tag and you got to be able to, like in Pennsylvania, our law is you got to cut the ear and hang it to the ear. So a zip tie, I mean, I know this, this sounds trivial or whatever, however you say that, but it, it's absolutely necessary. You know what I mean? Got to have that pen. Got to have a zip yep. tie. 
if you get caught, if you get caught by, you know, game game warden or something, you're going to be through. They don't look. Here's the thing: you can't preach ethics and not be ethical. You know what I mean? If you're going to talk, talk. You got to walk the walk and do it right. Yeah, it's that's part of hunting. You guys got to do it right. I have my Havilah knife with me and stuff too. Of course, flashlight, headlamp, Uh, and the very specific thing that I'm I've really switched to is ensuring that my headlamp is red light capable. So when I'm, I'm getting within 200 yards of my stand, I kind of switch to red light and maybe even sooner, depending on where I'm at. So to, to get that minimal approach to the stand that I'm not really put my signature out with the white light. So that's, that's something that I I have changed and we'll see how that goes. Makes it a little slower, slower going, which is okay because as you're going in there, you don't want to make as, as much noise and stuff. I mean, that's hard on me because I, I kind of deal with a lot of night blindness. And if I go red, it's, it's almost a blackout for me, you know, and that's unfortunate and it is what it is. But so I kind of got to stay white or green, but yeah, but I mean, like the, the one thing is, oh, the one thing when you're doing as far as a gear thing, and I just yeah. thought of this out of the blue, right? because you're talking about the light, the UV brighteners, when you wash your clothes, don't use like Tide with brighteners and stuff in it. You know, even if you're not a scent control person and use the wind, mm-hmm. the one thing that deer can really see is ultraviolet light. And they, if you're, if you have UV brighteners on your clothing, you can actually stand out more to a deer, even if you have the best camouflage in the world on yeah. it. So it's one of those things to take into consideration. Use, use a laundry detergent that's no scent. And doesn't have any, any of those UV brighteners in it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, generally wash my hunting clothes, sent away, makes a laundry detergent. And I use that because it's odorless. I don't, you know, and they have like an autumn scent too, but I think that could screw you up in early season because the leaves ain't falling yet. You don't want that autumn I smell just, that, that would kind of throw them off. You'd think. Yeah. I try to just go with the scent. Scent free yeah, stuff. I, I I definitely go with the odorless. Yeah. Now, as far as scent control stuff goes, just on yeah. a normal basis, we sh- we shower with the the soaps and the, put the deodorants on and all that for the scent free mm-hmm. stuff. You know, trying to minimize your signature. Deer can still smell that, but it's all about minimizing your signature. I carry the like the bath wipes almost the heavy yeah. duty scent free wipes because in the early season, I want to when I get to the tree, I'm wiping that stuff off because I'm just mm-hmm. you know foreign sweat and that's why i also like those uh, those hoodies that have the zipper the half zip so you can have it open and air blow blowing right. through when you're when you're walking into your spots so you don't don't sweat as much as, if possible sometimes like the heat now some some of those guys that are hunting right now in like tennessee and kentucky in 90 degree heat that's crazy oh yeah, yeah. we did that down in delaware me and dad a couple years back and it was like 88 90 degrees I'm sitting in a blind and I was just hooking in that thing. I was, you're talking earlier before the podcast about one of them rotisserie chickens from giant. <laughs> I felt like one of them in that blind, man. <laughs> Dude, it's hot in a blind when it's, when it's that hot out, you know, but, oh, real quick. <laughs> Sorry. I have some, uh, still blowing around here. Milkweed. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're talking about gear uh clothing you know and i did want to say that i i just started using and it's more for my early season i mean i could wear it through but i I got that hex gear oh yeah Yeah. h-e-c-s so my first real encounter with this hex gear is we were hunting that edge of the field i think it was opening weekend or whatever and i had a, a very young doe or button buck whatever it was i mean almost run right at me like I, I was like, dude, it's, it's going to run right into me. Like it blew me away. Cause that takes your signature away, you know? And yeah. I, I was like, I mean, first time wearing the stuff out in the woods. And I was like, holy crap, instant results. Hey, so could it have been a fluke? That deer was running with his tongue out. It was running from something and it could have been dad, dad down farther spooked it out. But I, you know, I was like. Now I'm really interested going into this season to get more opportunities wearing that stuff to see how it works out. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to, 
to see? Are you waiting to more midseason to start wearing no, that? No, thing? I mean, it's super light. So you could actually double base layer with it. Like going into the later part of the season, you know what I mean? But early season, it's perfect. You know, with like that hex gear, because it comes with a hood, you know, a top and a bottom. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you can get the gloves and the socks to go with it, which I do not have yet. But, you know, at that point, just wear your regular early season stuff, like like my, you know, subalpine tra- traverse pants and top, you know, stuff like that to go with it. So it's going to be, I'm excited, man. You know, you know, we're, what are we? Like 18 days away? Something like that. Close. Yeah, oh my close. gosh. It's like, oh, 20 days or something like that. I've, I, my head spinning. I started packing my bag. I started putting things in and I'm just like, like, like I was almost shaky. Like, oh my God, it's almost time. <laughs> I can't. Oh my God. Except for the first, except for the first week, every week after that, I have every single Friday off. And then I have the, through the season, I have the week that we're going with Andy down there. Yep. The, where That's he a, has this cabin yeah. and then that whole week the second week of november well so, um, i have yeah I, i'm i'm kind of the same way starting andy's weekend i have off that thursday friday the following week thursday friday the following week thursday friday and the following week thursday friday so it's it's we're, our asses are going to be in the seat you know what i mean we're going to get some good hunting in this year i'm i'm pumped man Hey, I'm looking forward to it. And that's a good point to bring up. If you're listening to the pod or you're you're watching on YouTube, remember this. We are going to be putting all the content from season on here. It's going to be the good, the bad, the ugly, and the funny. There's going to be plenty of ugly. (laughs) You know what? Learning more lessons. So that's great. But it's going to be an up and down season. It always is. You know, you have those frustrating hunts and you have the good ones. And yeah. And so it's going to be, it's going to be fun and we're going to be bringing it all to you sometimes, yeah, maybe even from up, up at our, our camp doing the pot uh, straight from there. I'm looking forward to going out to Muster's place, hunting that land, doing a podcast right from his camp, Camp Freedom. And, you know, that's, that's going to be neat to have him back on and, and getting some hunting time with him. But, you know, if you want to keep moving here with gear, what kind of boots are you wearing? So I got, I got some muck boots just muck rubber boots is what i'm wearing it's, that's it's kind of been a staple i had uh, my god i had these field and stream rubber boots that i got in 2011 and up until i wore them every year up until last year and they when they bombed out of me and tore <clears throat> so they lasted me quite a while for those cheap boots and they're uninsulated now i have i have a, a pair of lacrosse uh 1200 Graham Thinsulate boots for the, when it gets really cold, that's my heavy duties or they're my moon boots, <laughs> climbing trees. And those are always, it's always interesting. But, uh, then I, then I have my Merrill, uh, hiking, hunting boots or hike. Yeah. Hiking boots that I wear sometimes when I, I'm going to go on a good trek. And cause you know, sometimes in those rubber boots yeah. slide around and get blisters and stuff. If you do a real long trek. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I read a study about Lego boots. And, you know, I think it was Steve Ronello. It was a meat eater podcast. They were talking about, you know, the benefits of rubber boots versus actual hiking style hunting boots. And believe it or not, hiking style hunting boots won out everywhere but Pennsylvania. <laughs> of all places. So that's where we are. Because there's so much water. We have so many little tributaries and stuff that feed it, you know, coming off the mountains and are. No, if you get some good there. rains through the fall oh, and it's, it's just getting, getting to some spots, you're going to trudge through some yeah. water and, and I want to be prepared. I actually have a set of waders that depending if I find the right spot that I yeah. have to cross, cross a, a big creek or whatever, I'm going to, I'm going to throw them on and just kind of stash them on the other side and wait till I get back. So I'm ready to do it if I have to. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go down and I'm going to cross the water. Right down there from uh, that, that little spot that you found, that big you know, bedding area and all those that tracked up area there with you and the old man scouted. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Stay away. Dan sent me a special signal. <laughs> <laughs> now, me hunting off the ground, I'm exclusively 
and rubber boots. I, I hunt with the lacrosse alpha burly pro. I have, you know, zero insulation. I have 800 and I have thousands. So thousands, 1000. That's now early season. I feel it's more of a necessity because it's more rainy, but snakes, I, I, I'm on the ground, dude. I want, I want knee high boots. You know what I mean? It's just a little added protection. Uh, Did you hear we, the old man said that up there at, uh, one of our, uh, family's camp that's up there in Lycoming County that uh, they have, they killed seven rattlesnakes around the camp. They couldn't even, you know, they'd like to re they don't like to kill them. They want to relocate them, you know, yeah. but, uh, they were, they relocated a bunch and they were coming back. So, <laughs> which is crazy, but yeah, that many rattlesnakes with kids running around the camp and stuff. They had a lot that's, of little kids up there yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So they had, they had to take action, but that's a heck of a lot of rattlesnakes. So yeah, yeah early season, still warm like that. Yeah. I'm definitely having the, the rubber boots on. Yeah. I, I, the rubber boots for me, I, I had an encounter out, you know, we call it County line and I'm sitting there and I was like, what the hell is that noise? What am I hearing? You know? And I was on the ground and I was in my blind. And I just caught it out of the corner of my eye. Here comes a rattlesnake slithering down, coming right towards me. And I'm like, I mean, I never packed up a blind. And I mean, there was a Dan Zemer size hole right through the other side of that blind. <laughs> and I was going, man, dude, it scared the crap. I'm, I'm not, I like snakes in pictures, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not real big on them in person, rattlesnakes, copperhead, stuff like that. Now, you haven't hunted that spot since then, have you? No, no, I haven't because of that <laughs> reason. I, I, I know it sounds stupid, but it's like a PTSD. <laughs> I, you know, it is, it's, it's got me. So that's where I'm like, rule of thumb, wear knee high boots. I got to have a little bit of protection. We are too far away from a hospital. Yeah. It's almost like copperhead or, or rattlesnake. I, I almost feel like we wouldn't make it there in time. Because we're so far out. Yeah, you're know? only getting to that urgent care, and I don't know if they're prepared for that. No, I don't know if they got the anti-venom. But yeah. Ugh. So we talked about gear, you know, going through it, and but when all the gear's said and done, and you're all ready to go out, you know, what are you looking for here, getting ready for the you know for the early season as far as sign, you know, what 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 things are are triggering the Dan Spidey sense when you're going in. So there's a term that we use that we have hashtags that we use. It's called F F D S. And what that means is fairly fresh deer shit. Uh, <laughs> so if we see some F F D S when I'm hiking in good, shiny stuff, good clumpy stuff, that's, that's really what I'm looking for. Uh, when the leaves start ch coming down, a lot of turned over leaves kicked up, you know, that, that, that's about as fresh as it can come aside from the FFDS is the kicked up leaves, you know, the scrapes, the rubs, all that good stuff. That's, that, that's the hot sign I want. So if you're looking now early season, it's a little bit different because you don't have the foliage drop. So once the foliage drop and you see a scrape and there's a bunch of leaves in it, that A1 is telling me that that scrape has not been visited for a while. You want, when the leaves are dropping, maybe one leaf in there. And that tells me that that thing's been, and you're going to see like a moisture dirt in the center of it that they, they, you know, they, they've been, I don't want to say pulling at, but moving at, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I'm looking for, where they're browning, where they're chewing on brows stuff like that. That's, you want to look for anything as fresh as you could see, you know, you don't want to see hoof prints that have been cut, you know, poke holes into the dirt that have been covered up or this, you want to see the freshest things possible. And that's what I'm looking for. And, you know, if you're not seeing that, it's probably pretty good to get out, reach out farther or go to a different area. Now I had two, two experiences this past weekend. Cause I went out and, uh, did some scouting and I was, was, uh, trying to, to put in another, another cell camera for the season. Of course I couldn't get it to connect, so I didn't get to put it in, but the trip was not, the trip was worthwhile because 
when I went up and the side of the mountain, I was in that upper one third that we talk about, you know, with deer bedding and stuff. And I came across, I hit a scrape and I was like, Whoa, this is mighty early for a scrape, you know, cause I knew it wasn't there before. Cause I traversed this area previously, you know, a couple of times through the summer. And I was, I went a little further and I hit another scrape and I'm like, what? <laughs> Dan's still dropping milk. <laughs> so, and then of course I go, I go a little further and I hit what looks like a community scrape. It's right on the trail. There's a whole bunch of branches down and the branches are all just tore up. You know, you could see a freshly broken off yeah. and stuff. And it was probably, I want to say easily six, seven feet wide. And so it, it's right on the trail. It's not, you know, I was like, is this a turkey scratching? Or yeah, 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 no, yeah. No, I, hoof... I was actually going to ask that. Like, you sure it, it wasn't hoof... turkey? Her f hoof prints in it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, this is the biggest community type scrape that I've seen up in that area ever. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, and here's the, here's the bonus to it. Right off of there was where stream comes down, down the mountain, a drainage, you know, a drainage and right next to there was also acorns dropping. Perfect. So yeah. I'm, I'm like, wow, this, uh, this is telling me right now, if I was in season, if it was, I'd be right there right now. Yeah. Cause yeah. that sign's telling me it's hot. It's ready to go. You have fresh grapes, you have food, you have water, especially cause of the heat that yeah. we've had. Can't guarantee what the weather's going to be like here coming up. If you're going to have, you know, that water could be a crucial part of their, Absolutely. of their regimen that they need that water close by. So, but anyway, we went to another spot and this spot we went up and it was close to, to my, my one camera where, where there's a lot of rocks and stuff. And down from there, about 200 yards down from, from that, where that camera is sitting, there was a dead beat down trail. I'm talking a funnel trail carved through the thick stuff going up through and acorn patch halfway up it that was immense with really good tree yeah. at about uh about 20 yards 15 20 yards and i was like this is a perfect uh east wind spot and then up higher i found a perfect west wind spot yeah uh, that i'd have to come in different angles in that on that spot altogether. but and, and then but the kicker was a fresh rub mm. So had a fresh rub from getting the velvet off. Right. I was just right. going to say velvet time. Yeah. Yeah. Getting the velvet off, got food, got a cameras confirming that there, I got two beautiful bucks in the area. Yeah. 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 yeah you said that one. Oh, he's, that's a Jim dandy. Oh, yeah. So uh, things like that are, are triggering my spidey sense and saying, uh, you know, you have, if you know where they're, or generally where they're bedding, you know, where where there's food, where, where they're getting drinks, you know, where their water is. And then yeah. you have that hot sign. That's, I mean, that's that travel route that you need to be on. You know, yeah. when you can estimate that you can be there while they're on their feet. Yeah. Because if you get too far in between those areas, if you have a lot of distance, you know, that home range, like I said before, could be a mile. Right. So you get that home range and then you go and say, boom. I can't be that far away. I need to be closer to bedding. So I can be tough. I can be tough. Sorry. Porter was just walking around. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. I could hear the dog. Was, uh, That's sorry. a big deal. Yeah. So it's a little tip, tap, tip, tap, tip, tap. Yeah. He's just checking on me. So because of timing here, do we want to go on to what, when your last day of scouting is? So my last day of scouting was this last weekend. Yeah. I. I mean, you're not going to put a time, let me put a time reference in there because for the listeners. So in Pennsylvania, if you're not familiar, Pennsylvania, the first day of archery season lands basically around the first of October, whatever Saturday that is, whether it's the September 30th, October 1st, 2nd, whatever that first Saturday is, either at the end of September or beginning of October is when the season starts. So if you take Labor Day, that was the last day I probably was in the woods and I won't go in again because I do not want to, to trigger, you know, blow deer out and have them way off because I'd burn that area out from being in there too much. And you don't want to do that. That the minimum I would say is three weeks. 
don't go after three weeks, don't go in, don't check cameras, understand what you got is what you got. And then do that in season scouting because you, d you don't want to you know, take a hot spot and, and ruin it by constantly need to be in there and checking camera, you know, cameras or looking for more signs and stuff. That's, that's the wrong thing to do. And I really don't have anything to add to that because I am in 100% agreement with you. And, you know, I'm done scouting until hunting season starts and I do my traditional early season scout hunt, you know, utilizing them first, you know, two weeks to kind of locate, do some scouting, get out and see what, what's happening in the woods, you know, and let, let that kind of lets me know everything I need to know to start patterning, pattern, pattern. Pat Thank you. The deer getting an idea of, of, you know, more of a plan for, for rut, you know, unless I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hard up to get a doe right away. You know what I mean? Then I'm not going to be doing as much scout hunting. I'm, I'm going to be kind of just probably dialing in on one certain area where I know all the doe go. So. Yeah. But hey, there's one thing that Pennsylvania just totally screws up on in this regard, because in Pennsylvania, you're not allowed to put like stands in, in the woods on public land until two weeks before the season. What? Yep. Two weeks yeah. before the season. And, and I get it. I mean, they don't want it out there that long, but I think it should be a month. I think it should be a month because of, of stopping your scouting technic the, the disruption, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And we were naive to that for a while. We went out, I mean, we've gone out the day before yeah. to help people find spots. No, you want the deer to get ago. used to seeing that, that, that set up there. If you're putting in a permanent blind for the season, the, you know, two weeks is not long enough, in my opinion, for the deer to get used to seeing and smelling that set up there and, you know, where they feel comfortable traveling by it again. I, I think a month, you're right. You know, Hey, well, I, the old man and I kind of broke the law on that a couple of years ago and I paid the price for it. We took my blind out, you know, I had never blind hunted, but I had a nice little field way out in the mountain. I mean, it's a mile and a half walk and, and, and China bear showed up. <laughs> put the, yeah. Put the blind in and it's, it's like two weeks into the season. I think right before my wife broke her leg. And I go out in the morning hunt. It's, a, you know, I walk in the dark way out there. I'm slinking in. I'm thinking I'm Johnny Badass. It's raining, the light little rain, you know, not not bad at all. I think, oh, I get to sit in the blind and be dry. And I get there and it's completely <laughs> destroyed. Completely destroyed and has the claw marks in it and just ripped up. And I'm like, son of a bitch. Well, I had a camera in there, but I took it out. That was a huge mistake having the blind there and not having the camera set over it. Yeah, it would have been nice to see again. what actually happened there, you know. Yeah. Because I think that bear, because I, if if you remember, I had a nice size bear, because I had a mock scrape there too, and the bear was at the mock scrape like crazy. He had it pulled down to the ground, was playing with it, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and then still had buck on it after he was there. So that's crazy how that works. No, yeah. but yeah, he he totally totally smoked my blind. That was really disappointed because that was brand new never used yeah. my wife had bought it for me and i was like oh man yeah so well, what do you think we'll wrap this thing this episode up yeah i think it's it's time to put a ribbon on it we talked a lot about about gear we talked a lot about you know stuff that you want to have with you in the woods you're going out there's little things that you might not think about that are really important and crucial to your success outside of your stand and and your other things like that and your, of course yeah. your bow and arrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we talked a lot about a lot of stuff like that. And then we got into a little bit of the sign and things you need to be focused on here going into the season, which I think we, uh, we did a pretty good job of running over that, Dan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, if you like the episode, you like the content we're producing, we have a lot more coming, a oh, lot yeah. more coming. Season's so, getting ready to start. Uh, this, this in season content should be killer. So subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Spotify and Apple, wherever you go, get your podcast. And we really appreciate it. We're not sponsored by anybody. We might get some free gear here or there to test, but we're definitely not sponsored. We're just a couple guys. And that's why it's called the Everyday Bow Hunter. So there you go, Dan. Yeah. I mean, we want to thank everybody. Like Mike said, I would like to ask you guys, listeners, subscribe, hit that like button. Leave a review, send in some questions, and thank you very much. Have a good night, everybody.